The Atlanta Braves offense broke out in a big way on Thursday night to take the first game of a four-game series against the Philadelphia Phillies. We'll answer that question. Is the Atlanta Braves offense getting ready for a big breakout? Can we believe the hot streak from Marcel Ozuna? And could we see A.J. smith Shaver in the big leagues at some point this season? We'll answer those questions and more on today's mailbag episode of Locked on Braves. So let's get into it. You are locked on Braves. Your daily Atlanta Braves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, and welcome back to Locked On Braves, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, where we cover your favorite Atlanta sports teams each and every day. I am your host, Jacob Mastriani. You can follow me on Twitter at shortstopball. Also check out my written work on the Braves over at bravestoday.com. Make sure you follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked On underscore Braves. Send in any questions, comments, or feedback that you have for the podcast. If you're sad, the intro music is gone, or the outro music is gone now, let me know, as one of the listeners did this week. Anything you want to hear to help improve this podcast for you please let me know today's entire podcast will be built around your questions so continue to submit those questions whether it be on twitter i try to answer all the comments on youtube as well so if i don't get to one of your questions here today make sure you ask it in youtube and while we're talking about youtube if you haven't already make sure you subscribe and if you're watching this video there hit that thumbs up button to help support the show and i can't thank you enough for all the support that you give me each and every day on the Lockdown Braves podcast, making this your first listen of every day and for listening every day. And some of our latest Lockdown Braves podcast everydayers, Bobby He, Jason Tibbles, and almost everydayer, Joseph Bradish, who liked my episode on talking about defense, so I appreciate that. Daniel Thacker, Chris Fuller, who enjoys listening on his way to work, Jeffrey Hammock, and maybe one of our youngest listeners out there, Liam Tunnel, three years old. Thank you so much, Liam, for listening to the podcast with your dad there. Holly Campbell, Gidster, Kristen Broadway, Sammy Lyons, and Joe Reese are some of our more most recent everydayers, or at least let me know that you're an everydayer. If you want to do that, make sure you let me know in the comments section below on YouTube. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash locked on MLB. All right, on today's podcast, it is a mailbag episode, so I'll be answering your questions. We'll start off talking about the game on Thursday night, though, an 8-5 win over the Phillies. Not going to spend a lot of time on it here. You want to hear more on that, you can listen to the postcast with me and Graham McCauley, which you get on the Lockdown Braves podcast feed or over on the Lockdown Sports channel, Lockdown Sports Atlanta channel on YouTube. But it was an 8-5 win over the Phillies, a back-and-forth game, really fun game to watch. Dylan Dodd got the start. I thought he was solid in this one. Not great, but I think a start you can live with with your fifth starter. I mean, gets you through five innings, gives up four runs. That home run to Harper really kind of changed it from what I think would have been a good outing into just a an okay, solid outing. But again, kept the offense in the game, and luckily the offense had it on this night. They broke out with eight runs. Really, everybody up and down the lineup, had a big night. Obviously, Austin Riley, the key man there with a couple of 450-plus foot home runs. Have the Braves hit a home run that wasn't under 450 feet this year? It's really hard uh, to think of too many. It seems like when they hit one, it really goes a long way. So Austin Riley continues the breakout. Glad I didn't jinx him because yesterday's podcast, which if you hadn't checked that out, I talked about Austin Riley is here. He is back after that long slump that he was in. He is fully back now, and I think there was more evidence of that On Thursday night, Marcelo Zuna with a couple more hits. We'll talk about him later in today's podcast. Do have a little bit of bad to talk about. And A.J. Minter gave up another run, a blue save in this game in the seventh inning. Now, I know a lot lot of you, and I saw you on Twitter commenting, you don't want to hear about him being unlucky anymore, but I, I don't know what else you call that outing. I mean, he looked really good in the first two batters that he faced I thought okay this is the AJ Minter you know that I've signed up for then Bryce Harper lays down the bunt which Bryce Harper you want to lay down bunts please you know be my you know do so if you want to do that all day long and then a dribbler that gets through the infield off of Castellanos I mean it it just goes by Minter's glove it just goes by Ozzy's glove I mean it was just perfectly placed and then the one mistake I did thought he made in this outing 
you know, you saw Sean Murphy, and if you listen to my podcast on AJ Mentor and where I think his biggest issues are, and if you haven't, make sure you go back and listen to that. But it was very clear to me when I did my deep dive on AJ Mentor, his biggest problem is cutter command. And if it's over the plate right now, particularly if it's up, it's getting absolutely hammered. And you saw that in the bat against Schwarber. Murphy called for a cutter down and away, probably wanted it off the plate down and away. It stays up. Schwarber's able to get to it. He crushes it into right field for an REI. Luckily, they were able to get Castellanos at home. He did not touch the plate just like Alec Bohm, but this time they got it right on a replay. So, again, I know nobody wants to hear it because it's just more of the same of what we've seen from Minter this year. He's just not coming through in those spots, and you're right. He didn't execute against Schwarber, but you know, a little bit of bad luck, two batters before that. I wouldn't even say bad luck. Harper just – laid down a bun. He took what they were giving him, but then the Castellanos ball that just snuck through the infield. So it, it's been that kind of season for Minter. I'm not giving up on him, but he's certainly not a guy that I trust when he comes out of the bullpen. And I don't think Snicker fully does either. It's why you're seeing him, you know, in the seventh inning, but you got to have him. You got to have somebody against that lefty against those lefties. And I don't think Lucas Litke has earned that yet over Minter. Perhaps we get to that point here soon, but you know, I still think Minter's the guy there. Uh, the Travis Darno pinch hit, I, I was calling for it. I know the timing of maybe my tweet when people saw it or thought maybe I was questioning the decision, but that's not the case. I tweeted that out before the decision was made because I was surprised to see Michael Harris even go to the plate. I thought it was a very obvious decision there to go with Travis Darno. And look, I like Michael Harris, and I talked about this on the postcast. I like the swing he had earlier in the game. You know, he drove the ball to left field, got under it just a little bit, which again is what we talked about. He's still hitting balls the other way. He's just not finding that sweet spot and he's popping them up. But luckily, he did it this time in a good spot that drove in a run on a sack fly. But still, Travis Darno is the answer there with the way that Michael Harris has struggled. You got a lefty up there throwing 100. You know, Darno is the answer. Even if they would have sw uh, swapped there and gone to a righty, I still feel more comfortable with Travis Darno coming through in that spot. So absolutely the right call there by Snicker. Again, my tweet was more questioning. Why wasn't he out there to begin with? Cause Michael Harris walked into the batter's box, like he was going to bat. And then they had the meeting on the mound. I guess Snicker was going to see if they were going to change pitchers, but again, righty or lefty there, I thought Travis Darno was the right call and he did come through with a big hit there. And I love the outcast night. Talked about this. You know, I love when the Braves bring in the community. There's so much great history in the Atlanta community that you can get people involved like that. I mean, I think it's one of the, I think it was the third largest attended uh, crowd uh, at Truist Park. I mean, it was the lines to get into the stadium were just absurd. So it was a lot of fun. I'd love to see the team do more like that with some of the legends in the community that there are in Atlanta, but it was a lot of fun. Big boy on the broadcast was a lot of fun as well. Calling that knuckle curve uh, from Aaron Nola. So I thought it was a great night at the ballpark. Not only a great game, but I thought they did a great job with the outcast stuff. All right. I went a little bit longer on the game talk than I anticipated, but we will get into the questions here in a minute. I'm fortunate enough where I get to work from home, so I get to wear pretty much whatever I want to most of the time. But now I am wearing bird dogs pretty much exclusively when I work from home because not only are they comfortable, not only do they fit well and fit nice, but they look pretty good as well. And I don't mind looking good if I can also feel good. And I love that with these bird dog shorts that I've been wearing. I do work from home. So like I said, I'm typically just wearing shorts and t-shirt all the time and I want to feel comfortable, but I also do have to go out of the house, whether it's to run to the, the grocery store, drop the kids off at school, whatever it may be. And it's night, nice to not have to change clothes to look acceptable to the public eye whenever I go out. So it's great to have these pants, these bird dog shorts that I have now, because like I said, they're stylish. They look good. They feel good. Everything you could want in a pair of pants. So if you like that as well, and that's something that you're looking for, make sure that you go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB and enter the promo code locked on MLB at checkout. They'll throw in a free custom bird dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. Again, that's birddogs.com slash locked on MLB. Enter the promo code locked on MLB. All right, the Braves play the Phillies again on Friday night at 7.20 p.m. Eastern. They'll send another rookie pitcher to the mound and Jared Schuster. Catch every pitch of the Braves' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. 
Let's dive into the questions now. First one coming from Matt, who says, I was so excited to see small ball with TDA and Ozzy to win the game. Talking about a couple of nights ago. That tells me they have the ability to do so. But tonight, talking about Thursday's game, second and third, no outs. The heart of our lineup comes up and three straight punch outs. Strikeouts are not just another out in that situation. Is a perfect example. We need to adjust our approach in certain situations. Thoughts? I agree wholeheartedly. Um, you had Matt Olson and, and Ronald Cunha, second and third, nobody out with Riley and Murphy and Rosario coming up and three straight strikeouts. I, I get it with Riley and Murphy. Um, you know, they're, they're big power. They have big swings. They take big cuts. It's hard to tell those guys to just cut down on their swings, but you kind of have to in that situation. You got to score a run there. They, they can't have a situation like that with a heart of your order coming up and just not put a ball in play even. I mean, with Acuna at third, you just got to put the ball in play and he's going to score. Uh, they do have to change their approach there, and I get it. You want them to hit that three-run homer. You want them to hit one in the gap. You got to put the ball in play there, and I think at some point you do have to change your approach, but how often do they work on that for guys who are going to slug you know, close to 500? How, how often do they work on that approach? I don't know. I'm not – you know, there every day for batting practice to see those things. But I, I do think there has to be a little bit change of impro approach, especially once you get to two strikes. You got to put the ball in play there. I mean, it's just plain and simple. You got to do a better job of putting the ball in play there. Eddie Rosario, who we're going to talk about more in a second, that's the one to me. He is the guy that typically is going to put the ball in play there. So that was a little bit more surprising. But there was already two outs at that point as well. So, again, it's tough because you're talking about your, your three and four hole hitter who, again, have big power, have big swings, especially Sean Murphy. I mean, that guy is not cut down on a swing at all, but I think you got to. You have to in that situation. You got to score a run there. Annabelle Self, why do you think some teams have underperformed so far this season despite high preseason expectations and big off seasons like the Padres and Mets? How do you feel the Braves have performed so far compared to preseason expectations? I mean, you look at the Braves. They're one of the best. They have one of the best records. And all of baseball, I went over team numbers yesterday as well. They were top five in OPS, top five in ERA. So I think the Braves are meeting expectations because they came into the year as you know viewed as one of the best teams in all of baseball. And I think they've lived up to that so far, even though you know maybe it doesn't feel like it at times for Braves fans. They have lived up to their expectations so far. Why the Mets and uh, Padres specifically haven't gotten there? I for the Mets, it's obviously a lot of injuries. They're banking on Scherzer and Verlander being Scherzer and Verlander, and they've been hurt a lot at the beginning of the year, and they're you know getting old in age. And I think that's a big part of that. So their rotation is kind of you know falling apart at times. It's starting to come together a little bit now, and their offense it's built on you know get, drawing walks, stringing hits together, and you know. I don't know. I haven't watched every one of their games, but I would guess maybe that's taken a little bit of a step back. We've always known they've lacked the power, which plays a lot in today's game. But I think the biggest thing for the Mets is just the pitching. And I honestly think that's the one of the issues with the Padres as well. When I did my crossover episode with Javier Reyes of Lockdown Padres, who is fantastic, you know, that was the one thing I said with the Padres team that worried me was just that they didn't have the pitching, the starting pitching to hold up. And then you got, Manny Machado slumming to start the year. Juan Soto, you know, I think those guys will get going and the offense will be fine. Saw them have a big win over the Nationals on Thursday. But I think it comes down to starting pitching. You're seeing it, you know, with the Braves. It's really been a tax on them. If you don't have, like the Braves had 11 or so guys deep in their starting rotation to start the year, and that's been decimated already. You got to have that kind of depth coming into the season, quality depth, where things can fall apart quickly for you at the big league level. E. Goldie, which NL East teams do you think will ultimately push the Braves the most when all is said and done? Um, he said team plural. I still think it's going to be the Mets and the Phillies. Again, for the Mets, it's all can Verlander and Scherzer stay healthy and lead that rotation. If they can, I think they're going to be a powerful force. I still believe in the Phillies. I mean, you look at that lineup and it's just so deep i mean you just there's no real easy outs in that lineup especially with the way brandon marsh was swinging the bat at least in april i mean that's just a really deep lineup i i think i trust their bullpen which is you know 
hard to say after what we saw on Thursday night, but I still think I trust their bullpen a lot with the guys they have out there. At least they're, at least they have big time stuff, swing and miss stuff. And, you know, you still got Nola, you got Wheeler, Taiwan Walker, who we're going to see on Friday night needs to be better for them. Hopefully not on Friday night, but I still think those two are going to push the Braves the most. Look at the Braves, just do their thing and take care of business the rest of the way. I think they're going to be just fine. I said coming into the season, I think they're the most complete team. I believe most people believe that, and I think it, it's true. But I still think those two are going to you know, push in the NL East, push for a wild card spot. As far as the Marlins go, you know, I know they've been in second place a lot here, at least recently. I think they're a good young team. I just don't think they have the offense to hold up. They've got to win a lot of one-run games, which they have. They have an exceptional record with one-run game so far to start the season, but they just can't get into too many slugfests. They can't win a game like the Braves played on Thursday night. They just can't keep up offensively like that. So I think the Marlins will eventually fade a little bit because I don't think they have the offensive prospects that are going to come up like the Mets do. The Mets, you know, one reason I like the Mets coming in the year, I knew they had um, Beatty. I knew they had Francisco Alvarez, Vientos. They got some other bats as well that could come up and play a key role for them. Marlins don't have that right now. Uh, they got Yuri Perez. They got pitchers. They can call up and make an impact there, but they just don't have the bats to hold up. Um, Corey Slovic says, how long does Ozuna have to stay hot for the thought of trading him to stop being absurd? And uh, I like the way that question is phrased there by Corey, but really it comes down to do we believe in this hot streak? Is this Marcelo Zuna? Is this the 2020 version of Marcelo Zuna that we thought we were getting when we signed him? I, I don't know. Uh, again, I don't want to be fooled by, you know, what's almost a month sample size now where he's been really good, but we also saw a month before that where he was really bad and looked useless at the plate and everybody, myself included, was ready to drop him. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I need to see more to, to answer your question. How long I need to see another month of this. And it doesn't have to be a crazy month. Like we saw in May where all the home runs, uh, my biggest thing that I've been talking about with Ozuna and the streak that he's on, it's that he's been more of a complete hitter. You've seen him take his walks, which he's really done all year, but you've seen him, you know, loop the ball the other way for a hit. He, he's taking his singles. He's not just a one trick pony right now and hitting the home runs, which those are coming, but he's doing more. You saw him go uh, first to third on, on a hit to left center. I mean, you're starting to see him do other things than just hit a home run strike out and walk, be that three true outcomes player. He's doing more for you and he's doing it consistently. You're seeing better at bats from him. If I see this for another month, then I'm going to start getting a little excited. But, you know, I've said even, you know, in past off seasons, all last season, Marcelo Zuna is a guy I still believe. You put him in a lineup, give him 450 at bats, he's going to hit 25 to 30 home runs. I've never doubted the power potential of Marcelo Zuna. And if he's going to hit 240 and hit 25 to 30 home runs and bat seventh or eighth in your lineup, then so be it. There's worse seventh and eighth, eight hole hitters, you know, in baseball. But again, what he's showing right now is he can do a little bit more than that. He can do other things for you. And if that's the Ozuna we're going to get, then great. But I need to see more of that because I've seen him have hot streaks like this before and then just completely fade away. We ha can't have him just completely fade away where he becomes an automatic out in the lineup. But again, to answer how long, I need to see it for at least another month before I'm on board with Ozuna, but it's been, you know, it's been great to see the streak that he's been on. And again, as I keep saying, all credit to him because I mean, everybody was writing him off after the first month of the season. And like I said, it wasn't just that first month. It was two years and a month that we saw that of Ozuna, which is why everybody was ready to, to get off the bandwagon. Big dog fan, 73 percentage chance. We see AJ Smith Shaver in the bigs in 2023. Um, another question came in. Apologize, I didn't write the name down here, but they asked, with Smith Shaver doing so well, do you think he pitches in the majors before the All Star break? Will Soroka get the call before him because he is on the 40 man? Answer the last question first. Yes, Soroka gets a chance before AJ Smith Shaver. And I think Soroka gets a chance very, very soon, if not this coming up week. So, yes. Michael Soroka gets a, a chance before A.J. Smith-Shawver. Do we see A.J. Smith-Shawver before the All-Star break? I would say no, 
unless the the rotation just completely gets decimated to the point where you have to, I would say no, not before the All Star break. And then to answer Big Dog fans question, percentage chance we see Shaver in the Bigs in twenty twenty three. I'm going to say 70%, which is is just crazy because I think they have aggressively promoted him, but he's already at AAA. It's only two starts, but he he's looked like he belongs there. And while I don't know if we see him this year as a starter, I, I do think there's a good possibility at the end of the year that maybe we see him as a reliever. Maybe they do what they tried to do with Spencer Strider a couple of years ago, bring him up as a reliever at the end of the season, and then maybe use him as a weapon in the postseason. Now, this is a guy who hasn't thrown a lot of in- innings professionally, so you want to limit his workload for sure, and I think they'll do that, and I think that's part of why we probably don't see him as a starter this year. But I do think there's a good chance we see him as a reliever, which is why I put it at 70%. Now, he has to be added to the 40-man roster, and all that, but I'm starting to believe now that maybe we do see him this year in a reliever-type capacity. Like I said, for him to be called up as a starter, he'd have to really be setting the world on fire, and the options they have right now would just have to be falling flat. Schuster would have to fall flat, Dodds, Roca. You know, I think there may be some guys at AAA right now ahead of him that might get an opportunity before Smith Schauber because he is still really young. He doesn't have a lot of professional innings under him. One thing that's been on my mind a lot lately though you're seeing all these pitcher injuries and it's no longer a question of if a pitcher will get injured it's when and I think there's many factors for that I know a lot of people have been talking about the pitch clock maybe attributing to that arms just weren't meant to be used in the way that pitchers use them so they're going to get hurt at some point if you feel like you have a guy who can contribute now at the big league level why not go ahead and use him? Because you know at some point that arm's going to give out. He's going to need Tommy John. He's going to need shoulder surgery, something. I mean, what pitcher hasn't gotten hurt who's pitched long enough? Very few, especially at the the way that pitchers pitch today with max velocity, max effort. You know what's going to happen. If you got a pitcher and you feel like he can pitch at the big league level now, why waste that when you know there's a good chance he's likely going to get injured at some point, I think about Paul Skeens coming up in this draft out of LSU. I believe that guy can pitch at the major league level right now. And whoever drafts him, how long do you really waste his talent at the minor league level if you think he can get major league hitters out, not knowing when a potential injury may come? And, and hopefully it doesn't come. Hopefully it doesn't come for A.J. smith Shaver anytime soon. But I think we've come to a point now where we realize it's coming at some point. And why not, if you have a guy who you think is good enough, why waste his bullets in the minor leagues when you think he could be getting hitters out at the major league level? So long-winded question there, but I've kind of come around on the fact that I, I'm feeling like we do see A.J. smith Shaver this year as a reliever. Again, especially if this bullpen struggles like it has been, then I think you know he could give a big boost to this bullpen later in the season and then into the postseason with just the big stuff that he has. All right, we got a lot of other questions that I want to get to here. But first, I want to tell you about a Rocket Money. Do you remember that 30-day free trial you signed up for 90 days ago? You likely don't because that's been me several times as well. And that's why I need to get Rocket Money to help find those unwanted subscriptions. And they can even cancel them for you. Over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about. You could be wasting money and not even realizing it. Rocket Money helps you find those forgotten subscriptions so you can stop paying for the ones you don't use. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. You can go to a lot of Braves games with that money saved. Stop throwing your money away, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash MLB. That's rocketmoney.com slash MLB. All right, a lot of good content this week on the site for you. you. got the Miners Monday episode. We talked about Michael Harris, did a deep dive on him. I talked about the defense and how it's been struggling this year, and some of you didn't like hearing that, but I enjoyed that episode, at least talking about defense, not talking about how bad the Braves have been. And then we went through the league on Thursday as well to tell you how the Braves have maintained their lead in the NL East despite 
that rough stretch that they went through. So if you haven't already, make sure you go back, check those episodes out. But let's finish off this mailbag episode. Like I said, got a lot more good questions here to get to. Jackson Johnson says, what are the strengths and weaknesses that the Braves have that everyone needs to look out for? Uh, the strengths of this team are on offensive. It's offensively, it's obvious the obviously the power. Um, pitching wise, it's the strikeouts, which surprises me a little bit. But Spencer Strider is just dynamic at the top of that rotation. Weaknesses, probably the back of the rotation and bullpen right now are a bit questionable. And then hitting with runners in scoring position, doing the small things, uh, striking out offensively would be the uh, the weaknesses for the Braves that you need to look out for that are hopefully going to get better and improve as the season goes along. Large Lars says, how close is Colby Allard to coming back? Last I heard, and this has been a couple of weeks now, that he was beginning to throw. He's kind of where Max Fried is now, which update on Max Fried. He has started throwing again. It's basically like starting spring training over, which is, again, the same kind of where I believe Colby Allard is. So I think all-star break is probably a pretty solid timeline for both of those guys. Chip Burnett, what can the Braves do to get Harris hitting? Go back and listen to Tuesday's podcast, did a deep dive on that. But there's also been a lot of talk about that this week. Chipper Jones apparently has been working with him and had him focus on hitting line drives to shortstop, and that's kind of what I talked about on Tuesday's podcast as well when Michael Harris was going really good last year. He was driving the ball the opposite way. Right now we're seeing him hit pop-ups and fly balls the other way. It's really just the launch angle that's off, which – I think can be contributed a lot to the, the back and knee issues that he's having, but it's really that he's just off the baseball a little bit right now. And once he gets that down, we're going to see Michael Harris take off. And I think it's coming pretty soon. Houston McInvale says, is it time to do something with Minner? I know we only have one other lefty, but in 2021, he went nuts after coming back from a stint in Gwinnett. I think if the Braves had a, another lefty option right now, like if Dylan Lee were healthy and we hadn't overused him already this year, that maybe you do either send Mentor down or put him on the IL and just give him a break and let him kind of mentally work through things. But like I said, I don't think you want to leave Lucas Litke as your only lefty, and I don't think you want Lucas Litke and Danny Young to be your only lefties in the bullpen. I think Mentor just has to work through this, and I think you have to pick your spots with him when you're going to use him right now where he can be – most effective and I get on Thursday you want to bring him in because you had a couple of lefties coming up but it was top of the lineup lefties and again I said it you know it was a little bit of bad luck mixed in there as well but I think you just have to pick your spots with mentor right now try to avoid some high leverage situations against the top of the order if you can hopefully you can get that confidence back but unfortunately for him right now the Braves need him and they need him to be mentor and they're just going to have to, to live with some of the struggles that he's having and hope that he can work through them. Jordan Griffey says, does Rosario deserve the amount of playing time he's getting? Saw a lot of talk about this on uh, Twitter as well on Thursday. Maybe we'll do a deep dive on this on Tuesday. But what are your other options? It's Sam Hilliard, who was really good while Michael Harris was out, but the strikeouts are highly concerning. It's Kevin Pillar, who you're mostly been using against lefties, but you know has had some really good at bats. I, I just don't know. I, I don't know that you can just count on the other options being better. And Rosario, I think, has shown shown signs of being a good player during the year, um, especially after a slow start. I think he's been much better. Like I said, he at least usually, other than that spot we talked about on Thursday. Usually he's going to give you a good at bat and put the ball in play, which gives you a different dynamic in this lineup, which is just full of strikeouts. Rosario is typically somebody who is going to put the ball in play. He's come up with some clutch hits. He's actually been really good defensively. Again, like we talked about on Wednesday's podcast, he's surprisingly, at least according to the metrics, been a very good defender this year for the Braves. So does he deserve to bat fifth? I think maybe is the question. Does he deserve these at-bats right now? I think so, because I just don't think you can count on Sam Hilliard or Kevin Pillar really being that much better getting full-time play out there. So I'm fine with Rosario continuing to get these at-bats for now, but he probably needs to be moved down in the order a little bit at this point. 
Uh, last question, this one from Bellfire says, offense overall is really showing signs of breaking out in a big way. Will this lead to major improvement in our hitting with runners in scoring position? I hope so. Like I said, we, we did a deep dive on runners in scoring position. We've done a lot of deep dives here lately, a lot of good stuff on the podcast. But when I talked about that, you know, runners in scoring position is a number that usually kind of levels out as the season goes on when you're, you know, obviously it's going to be bad when you're not playing your best and it's going to go up whenever an offense does heat up so I think it will it's always going to be a bit of a struggle for this offense just because there is so much swing and miss that you know they're going to struggle to put the ball in play with those runners in scoring position and get those added hits so it is going to you know I think always generally be somewhat of a problem for this team but obviously if the offense is improving and they're hitting better and seeing the ball better up and down the lineup then those runners in scoring position number it's got to improve because where it is right now is just not sustainable for this offense. It's got to move more to the, the middle of the pack. So I think you will see that get better. All right, a little bit of news. Dylan Dye was obviously called up on Thursday to start. Michael Tonkin went to the IL. Um, take for that what you will. If you you really think there's something going on there or not, the Braves just didn't want to lose him. But Michael Tonkin is the one who goes on the IL there for Dylan Dodd. On a Friday night, it's going to be Taiwan Walker versus Jared Schuster. Schuster, just continue what he's been doing. Limit the walks. Trust his stuff in the zone. Try to limit the long balls. You know, this is a Philadelphia Phillies lineup that will chase. So see if you can get some chases on that good changeup and slider that he has. And, you know, again, just more of the same. I think his last two outings have been very good and very encouraging. Taiwan Walker, a little bit of a tough year for him. 5.79 ERA. A 1-4-4 whip, 46 and two-thirds innings, just 42 strikeouts. His walk percent uh, is up to 11 this year, which is very high. So been walking a lot of batters. Still gets a lot of chases on that split finger. And also that sinker uh, throws mo- mainly throws split, seam, split finger, four-seam sinker. Also has a sweeper cutter and curve that he throws less than 10% of the time. So a lot of pitches there to deal with. Braves torched him last July for eight runs. He didn't even make it. Uh, out of the second inning. I think he started that second inning of that game, but didn't record an out. So hopefully we see more of that on Friday night. Would love to see this offense just continue to break out and go on a big run here, especially backing up Dodd and Schuster, uh, some of these young guys to help them out. The Braves play the Phillies again on Friday night at 7.20 p.m. Eastern. It'll be Jared Schuster versus Taiwan Walker. Catch every pitch of the Braves' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Braves. That will do it for this episode of Lockdown Braves. Thank you so much for making Lockdown Braves your first listen of every day. Thank you to all my everydayers out there. Also, make sure you follow us on Twitter at Lockdown underscore Braves. You can follow me at Shortstop Ball. Make sure that you rate, review, and subscribe to the Lockdown Braves podcast wherever you get your podcast. And we will talk to you next time.